we'll get started. Uh, thank you all for coming to the CAPS presentation this year. Our seniors have been working incredibly hard for the last few months on their projects, and we're so glad that you're here to celebrate their accomplishments with us. Um, this block, we'll have two presenters today. First, we'll have Natasha Shima presenting on her time at the MIT Bear Lab followed by Eli Corrin and his research into the Ultra Music Festival and his influence on <coughs> music in general. Uh, and here's Natasha. Good afternoon, everyone. As Ms. Garrity said, I'm Natasha, and I interned at um, a neuroscience research lab at MIT. So now, I bet a lot of you are wondering, how does a high school student get to do research at a world-renowned university? Well, let me tell you that six months ago, I had an internship all set up with Clover Food Labs in, in Cambridge, and they are um, they're a restaurant that serves vegetarian fast food sustainably to meat lovers and vegetarians alike. Well, about two months before my internship was due to start, I received a call from them informing me that they no longer needed an intern. <laughs> that was about a week after I found out I was deferred from college, so yeah, <laughs> December was really great. <laughs> <coughs> so I still was not able to let this idea of CAPS go because I found the whole experience of it intriguing and invaluable. So my aunt connected me to Ming at MIT, <laughs> um, and Ming and her, uh, and the administration at the lab worked their butts off to get a high schooler into the lab and appease the environmental health and safety group at MIT, <laughs> who were very difficult to work with. Um, so now that we know about my experience in the lab, I finally got to how I got to the lab, then I finally started my work. What do you take a minute to think about what you think people research in a lab? What do you think people are trying to cure? Is it cancer? Perhaps AIDS? <laughs> Maybe diabetes? What about lazy eye? <laughs> Ming works with a condition called amblyopia, which is a scientific term for a lazy eye. And she injects a solution called TTX into the eyes of mice with lazy eye. That will anesthetize the eye or temporarily shut it down and she hopes that once the, that the eye will restart itself so that it can work just as good as the other. So now that we, oh, and also, she's able to measure this with these electrodes that she puts in the brains of the mice. And they usually, um, the electrodes um, give us information that we can see in a wave, in a graph of certain waves. Um, and so now that we know a little bit about the research, what do you, now let's talk about what it was like in the lab. So what do you guys imagine when you think of a lab? You guys can shout out your ideas. Come on, do you think of like Why test tubes or like, like mad scientist hands? Yeah, so So we done. Okay, so these are the sorts of waves that are measured. So I did not use beautiful, like, um, I did not have these super cool, like, funky boiling pots and, like, crazy test tubes and stuff like that. But I feel like my experience, the stuff I worked with was pretty mundane. We had a nice workbench, like the ones in chem, and big fume hoods and stuff like that. <coughs> so um, I worked in histology which is what I kind of think of as the morgue. Um, so histology is basically the verification after an experiment that tells you whether that you collected your information in a valid way. So what I would do is I would get these brains after they did the tests on the mice in these little jars, and they were, kind of, they were really small, the brains, and then I would use what we thought of as the deli slicer to make these super thin slices of brain, and there's like a really sharp blade right there. Then after that, I would take these super thin, these paper thin slices, probably thinner than paper actually, and I would have this paintbrush. That was actually the most utilized tool, <laughs> the paintbrush. And then I would mount them onto these slides. 
but they had to be in a very precise grid. So it did take a lot of time to get it right. And then after that, I would bring them through a series of these dunk tanks of all of these chemicals, and I would stain them with something called Cressel Violet. And as you can tell from the name, it means purple. They're more of a bluish purple, but you get the idea. Then after that, I would head over into the room with the confocal microscope, which is way more intense than it needs to be. Um, <laughs> but I would take this microscope and I would take pictures of the slides, this one's upside down, and I would look for these little electro tracks. So this is one here, but this is a better image. Um, there's one here and one here. Um, and so I would have to decide if the electro tracks were in the correct location, which is in a certain part of the brain and a certain depth. <coughs> so I had to make a lot of judgment calls. Um, I had to decide how long to leave each slide in the stain. And I had to decide which slices actually had the electrodes. And a lot, I was trusted a lot with such, with tasks in such um, an intense environment. I was trusted with toxic chemicals, expensive equipment, and live animals. And I found that very, I found the trust very, I really liked having all of that trust. That's because in a lab environment, trust is key in the sense of community that you have to, because you're all working together for a common goal of science and education. Um, Okay. This will come up later. <laughs> um, so I also found that um, the way that what we learn in school versus in the lab, I did a lot of comparisons and contrasting things. Um, so one of the I was not able to contrast to an actual neuroscience class because I did not take one in school. Um, but I was able to use what I knew from my AP biology class and the biology class I took last year and compare that to the lab. So in the lab, or in biology class, we do these, we do these um, labs that are designed by teachers and learning institutes, and they're designed to give us specific results and be easily replicable. Whereas in the lab, people, in like the real world, you decide what you want to test for, you design the experiment, you do the procedure, you collect the results, you analyze the results. You don't know if it's going to work, but you give it a shot. And Jocelyn and Lissandro, two of the undergraduate students that I was working with, are only a few years older than me, yet they're already doing work like this. And it's not to say that we don't do the work like this in school. In my biology class in the beginning of the year, we did a fruit fly experiment where we created some sort of contraption by ourselves and designed the, the procedure to test their behavior. But my teacher knew we would fail and, um, and like it happened. So it was designed to fail. Um, and so from that, I noticed, um, or on top of that, I noticed just the way, um, <coughs> So I noticed that like, I really like to do stuff right away. Like I do my homework as quick as possible and then I write my essays really quick just to get them done. I think my record's like one hour or something. Um, but um, so I think living in a digital age makes us expect things to come really quickly. So one day I was at the lab and I asked Ming, do you think your research will ever make it to clinical trial? And she said that she would be extremely, feel extremely accomplished if her research made it to clinical trial in her lifetime. And I found, so research, especially in a field as new and um, unknown as neuroscience is extremely slow moving. And perhaps this is why I found that it is not quite the field for me. Um, but I'd be interested to see if this trend of wanting things to come quickly and instant gratification follows um, is apparent in the future. <coughs> so I also noticed the way people <coughs> help each other is different in school versus in the lab. In school, if I ask a classmate for help, they usually just hand me their paper and tell me to copy down the answers. <laughs> and if I ask a teacher, they do give me a more, a more thorough answer. 
I remember having this fascinating conversation with my biology teacher, Mr. Hillenmeyer, in the beginning <coughs> of the year, and we were talking about cellular respiration in terms of a runner's body. And I find it really interesting because I'm a runner myself, so I like things that can connect to my own life. Um, but it did take me four years to work up to being able to have conversations like that. Um, and then I remember one day I was in the lab and I asked Ming about this gene called TD tomato, which is a fluorescent gene that expresses red. And this is just an example of some fluorescence that I was working on, but it is not, this isn't TD tomato itself, it's just for an example. Um, and she spent like 15 minutes drawing these diagrams on the board to make sure I fully understood what was going on. And I find that really amazing because in a world of research and science, it's all about moving forward. <coughs> and it's all about moving forward and teaching the future generation um, about what you've learned and trying to encourage them to learn too. So finally, the thing I noticed most of all was how people cope with failure. So in school, I'm pretty sure we've all felt it. We hand in the test and feel really great about it. And then a few weeks later, the teacher hands it back and you get a C or a D or an F. And you feel everything <laughs> crash down and you're like, I'm never going to college. And then, as much as I admit that's, that was me, I think I've realized that that one test or one assignment does not matter. Um, <coughs> And definitely, I saw that a lot in the lab. Um, I remember one of the researchers, Dustin, he didn't get, he, his experiment didn't successfully work for like a year or something. And another researcher, Daniel, um, or David, sorry, a lot of D names. Um, David had this research that, and he collected results ex that were extremely different from what he expected. And the next thing they did was brought it, it was bring it to lab meeting, where then where, where they then talked about um, what they could do to make it better and got feedback from everyone in the room. So I found that the most important part was how you pick yourself up from the failure, not whether you have failure or you do everything perfectly the first time. So although I did not see myself going into neuroscience, I wouldn't have changed anything about my internship at MIT or my CAPS experience. What I hope you all take away from this is how you, we need to lift each other up and how we also have to lift ourselves up. If we are bold and we are unafraid and we are caring and we are here for one another, it's all going to work out. And I want to leave you with one final quote that um, the private investigator of the lab told me on my first day. I do not know if he remembers it, but I cer <laughs> it certainly touched me. He said, Science is a battle, and we are the warriors. Thank you.